Femi, yes, hi, I can hear you. I tell you what though, I'm down here at Said and it's pretty dead. Yeah, yeah, I uh, looked through the glass and I went around the back. Yeah, no social entrepreneurs, no social investors, no thought leaders, just pretty much tumbleweed. Yeah, where is everybody? Ah, there you are. Oh, now I see you. Is that pajamas? Hmm, looks like you're on the sofa, maybe with the dog, is that? Hmm, at home. Well, to those of you who've been to the forum before, I bet you're missing Oxford right now. But rest assured, the city is missing you too. Missing your dynamism, your ideas, your laughter, missing your big dance moves. And to those of you who are new to the Skull community, welcome. And I hope to meet you here next year in the city of the Dreaming Spires. In the meantime, walk with me. I'm gonna stroll over to the examination schools to meet Audrey Tang. She is a digital minister of Taiwan, Republic of China. She is a techno optimist. She believes governance can be more beautiful and she played a vital role in her country's COVID response. So come with me, we'll take the scenic route. There is a certain poetry to using the examination rooms where Oxford students sit their finals to interview a literal child genius who dropped out of school at 14 to design her own education online. She didn't need this place. There are a few other things you need to know about Minister Tang before you meet her, so I'm going to give you the lowdown as we go. The first thing is that I am officially obsessed with her. Yes, in preparing for this interview, I have tumbled down the Audrey rabbit hole and my assumptions about what's possible in a democracy will never be the same again. And I'm going to share that experience with you. The second is that Audrey was coding at eight years old and later worked as an open source software developer. Now she's hacking government itself. The third is that she was part of Taiwan's Sunflower Student Movement. In 2014, they occupied the parliament building for three weeks in protest at a controversial trade deal. When a new government was elected two years later, she became, at the time, the youngest minister without portfolio in Taiwanese history. And I love that she says she works with the government, but not for the government. Hmm. The last thing you need to know is that Audrey is championed as the first openly trans minister of Taiwan, indeed the first openly trans minister anywhere, but now identifies as post-gender. Her rejection of gender binaries reflects her rejection of binaries of all kinds. She believes there cannot be two sides to any argument, because once you get everyone involved, there is space to find shared values. Are you ready to meet her? Hello. Minister Tang, Audrey, it is wonderful to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Hello, very nice meeting you again and good local time, everyone. So we have to start with the pandemic because it's the reason that our audience are not meeting you in person in Oxford right now. Uh, in Taiwan, the Republic of China, you've had only 10 COVID deaths so far. Whereas in my country, here in the UK, we are already uh, over 125,000 lives lost and still climbing. So if this was the Olympic Games, you're well on the way to the gold medal, I think. Has it surprised you how badly countries like the UK, the US and Brazil have handled the pandemic compared to Taiwan? Or did you predict that? Did you see this coming a year ago that we would be in such divergent places now? It's not exactly surprising because the first time when SARS 1.0 hit Taiwan in 2003, we also reacted quite haphazardly. Um, we had communication failures between the municipal and the central government. We had to lock down an entire hospital unannounced. Uh, the constitutional court said that it would be unconstitutional if uh, we had a chance to predict something like it would happen, which we didn't. Uh, and so um, I, I think uh, we have sympathies of what you're going through. But uh, in Taiwan, in 2004, right after SARS, we institutionalized our counter-epidemic uh, command center task force, including the unified communication strategy, uh, universal mask use and stockpile, and so on, into the institutional memory with yearly drills, so that something like that would not happen again in Taiwan. And I hope that everyone else would do the same after this round of vaccination. So you're saying that the uh, secret to a gold medal is practice? 
well, our previous inoculation in all of society. Um, another aspect of your COVID response leads us on to the main issue that I wanted to explore with you, which is your political philosophy more generally and your introduction of participatory democracy um, to parts of uh, uh, the government's work. Can you talk about um, how that works in the first instance around the COVID response, but also kind of more generally your view of its role uh, in, uh, in, in society? Um, I think the government need to trust the people. The people may or may not trust back, but to give no trust is to get no trust. So the key to this fast counter pandemic and counter infodemic response is this ability to listen at scale so that anyone with a good idea can very quickly amplify it through official participation channels to the entire country. Um, comparing this to the old style of democracy, which is called voting, which is three bits per person of information uploaded every four years. Uh, we massively increased the bit rate. For example, I mentioned a toll-free number 1922 that people can call. Well, um, more than 2 million calls were placed to that call center uh, over 2020, many of them asking for clarification for counter-pandemic strategy, but also many offering their innovations. For example, um, there is a professor that called saying, you know, uh, I invented a way using the traditional rice cooker. If you don't add water, turns out that dried heat can kill the virus without destroying the mask. Well, it turns out he was correct. Or last April, there was a very young boy who called saying, hey, you're rationing out mask and all I get was pink medical mask. I don't want to wear it to school for all the boys in my class have navy blue medical grade mask. I don't want to wear pink to school. Well, the very next day on the 2 p.m. CECC press conference, all the medical officers wore pink regardless of their gender. And uh, uh, Commander Chen Shizhong, the Minister of Health, even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy immediately, overnight, literally became the most hit boy in the class because only he has the color that the heroes wear and the hero's hero wear, I guess. And so um, the, the point of these like literally 24-hour response cycle is that it gets the social innovators uh, into a mood of co-creation. If they had to wait for four years or a quarter or five weeks, uh, six weeks in order to even get their ideas consider, then people would not spend time on the co-creation. And so the whole point of participatory democracy is to listen to skill and to increase the bit rate of participation. And it's not just over COVID that you've invited this kind of interaction um, with, the, uh, with the population. Can you speak a bit more about the other participatory democracy projects that you've been running for the last couple of years? And I'm particularly mm -hmm. curious to understand how widely adopted they are. Mm -hmm. Certainly. For example, uh, the mask availability map was built upon existing civic infrastructures that shows the air pollution. Now, it's not just environmental protection agencies building such environmental sensing devices. A lot of primary schools in Taiwan, as part of their data competence, media competence, not literacy, producers, not consumers. So producers class of data competence, they invite very young people, primary schoolers, uh, to set up such PM 2.5 air quality sensing boxes and sharing them on a distributed ledger uh, so that people could see this air box network and uh, divulge what really is going on when it comes to the mobile, immobile or overseas sources of air pollution. A very similar network is there also for the water box, the water quality measurement. So in addition to climate science and data stewardship, we also use similar crowdsourcing mechanisms to make uh, laws and regulations. Uh, in our join the gov.tw platform, uh, where people could start petitions and and uh, comment on the regulatory pre-announcements and do participatory budgeting. There's more than 10 million visitors out of the country with 23 million citizens, so almost half of the country. And on that website, more than one quarter of petitions are started by people who are not even 18 years old, so by young people 
people, for example, on uh, petitioning to ban plastic straws on the takeout cups of our national identity drink, the bubble tea, um, which was successful, by the way. <coughs> and so all these uh, increased the everyday participation into democracy by very young people, even before they are of the voting age. And I think the adoption, especially around the young population and also the very old population, uh, is very high. You really are putting some extraordinary theory into practice right now. How are the political classes responding though? Because surely the end point of what you're describing is the end of legislators? Is it the end of elections? How radically is this going to remake or could this remake our democratic model? Well, I would say that the digital augments or assists collective intelligence. The digital is not here to replace collective intelligence. So to our legislators, they can, of course, uh, work still on the implementation, the budget, the coherence of the laws and so on. But they benefit from this listening as skill devices because they do not have the capacity anyway to listen to each and every one of their constituents. It was just not physically possible. But now, uh, aiming to understand what the common values, the rough consensus of all the stakeholders in the society were essentially crowdsourcing this uh, common feelings, this rough consensus, these how might we questions that define the issue. But while we crowdsource the agenda, we do not crowdsource particular solutions. These solutions are just ideas or prototypes for the legislators to consider. I think that is partly why uh, the four major parties, all the major parties in the parliament, just a couple of weeks ago signed on the open parliament plan, on the national action plan on open government because they all want to listen better to the citizens. That's about the only thing they would agree. Uh, also, more uh, international collaboration. That's one of the only two things they would agree. More democratization and linking to international uh, community. I want to see how this relates also to ideas about gender. As a gender non-conforming person myself, I'm super interested about how your gender experiences have informed your political philosophy. And you talk about yourself as being post-gender. It seems to me that you are mm -hmm. against all binaries because you are breaking down the idea that there has to be just two sides to any argument because mm -hmm. when you bring everyone involved, uh, that sort of explodes that binary. Can you talk a bit more about um, how, yeah, how your gender identity or your gender viewpoint and your political philosophy intertwine? Certainly. Uh, personally, I'm naturally born with a very low level of testosterone. So when I went uh, through my first puberty, when I was 12 or 13, I didn't go all the way, I guess, uh, through the male puberty. And then uh, when I was 24, 25, uh, I underwent another puberty, this time the female puberty, but again, just for a couple years and not, of course, all the way uh, through. And so to me, I don't have this uh, idea in my mind that somehow half of population is more similar to me and half of population is not at all similar to me. Uh, to me, my community is a very large community, is the homo sapiens uh, community. And that enable, I guess, me to take all the sides and empathize more. Talking of your two puberties, uh, which was the best and which was the worst? Well, they're, they're equally eye-opening, I guess. Uh, and I still remember um, talking to uh, internet commentators on Tyler Cohen's blog, and one of them saying, uh, you're the digital minister. How can you be non-binary? Uh, because digital binary, you know, computers are binary machines. Ones and zeros, yes. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm a human. I have 10 digits, right? I'm a decimal <laughs> digital minister. So to me, uh, being transgender is not just about uh, transcending existing gender binary categories. It also speaks to the wider intersectionality of, for example, transculturalism, transcending Taiwan's more than 20 national languages, many of which indigenous. And I spent a lot of time also on the indigenous communities, for example, the Amis, uh, which is a matriarchy, or the Paiwan, which doesn't care about gender when electing leaders, uh, and so on. So the more norms you travel through and the more sides that you're able to take, the more transcultural, not just transgender, we become. I have to say that only in preparing for this interview have I fully understood the ways in which Taiwan, the Republic of China, is bucking 
the current trends. In 2016, we had a Brexit vote in this country. Of course, Trump was elected and uh, Modi and Bolsonaro around a similar time. And I feel like the, the populists and the destruction of uh, democratic norms that we've seen in many of those places have sort of blinded us. They've taken all of the attention and people have perhaps um, failed to truly understand that in Taiwan something really revolutionary is happening. You are creating new democratic norms in a completely different way. How far do you think you can go? And can you tell me in your, in your ideal world, what is the, how would you describe the role of government? Um, I think the government, uh, which is a kind of singular noun, uh, would become uh, just governance mechanisms. Just as we say internet governance, we don't say the internet government, because internet is a set of interlocking governance mechanisms. The Internet Society, the IETF, the ICANN, and so on. These are the multi-stakeholder forums where people uh, find rough consensus and running code by sometimes humming together, right? So there's already a strong tradition, a strong transcultural tra tradition uh, of everyone who gets it's affected by any part of internet um, architecture to then join the working groups and contribute regardless of their country, their jurisdiction, or their age. I joined when I was 14 years old. Nobody said that, uh, hey, uh, Audrey is just 14 years old. <laughs> I kicked them out, right? So because of that, uh, I think this sort of governance where there's nothing about us without us, uh, where it's participatory in the here and now, where the governance mechanisms are uh, uh, transparent and uh, modifiable, uh, hackable, forkable by the people. I think these are the internet governance lessons, the core lessons that I learned when I was 14 years old and that I see widely applicable now that we have broadband as human right. The internet is not just for the few people who could enjoy broadband connection. Everybody now has the right to broadband connection in Taiwan. And you describe your philosophy or you describe yourself as a conservative anarchist. Yep. And mm -hmm. I didn't know what that meant. Um, so I actually, I bought this mug. <laughs> uh -huh. And uh, I'm going to read the mug to you. And then you can tell me if this helps. It says, one who has literal conservative values and objectives, but is intelligent enough to self-govern through anarchism. Note, this person is not concerned with the standard ideals of the American Conservative Party, e.g. anti-abortion, Christian, religious, anti-gay, pro-gun, although they can incorporate these ideals into their personal political structure, even if they are not in fact literally conservative. Is, does this mug help us understand your description? I think so, yes. Uh, it means that I take all the sites uh, and conserve the existing traditions. Uh, that I think is very helpful. Uh, and the so-called anarchistic means uh, simply means that I'm a Taoist. I, I give no orders. I take no orders. I just sometimes uh, write poetry. I call myself a poetician for that. Good. I'm glad it's broadly accurate. It's actually from the uh, Urban Dictionary, which of course is an open source dictionary, so probably quite up your street. I actually wondered if perhaps you'd written the definition. Uh, no, it's not me, but uh, yay, collective intelligence. Yay. So um, thank you so much for your time. I have to note that actually it's going to be your 40th birthday in a few days' time. Mm -hmm. That's right. So um, many, many, many congratulations uh, for your birthday to come. And um, I'll send you a mug. Excellent. Uh, consider it received. Um, Audrey, it's been such an honor and such a privilege to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the great conversation. Live long and prosper. Peace and long life. Wow, you're the second person to get it right. <laughs>